today, let's talk about the prisoner's dilemma. This is an example of it. Now, I want you to imagine that the police arrest two people, player one and player two, and the police are convinced that both individuals have committed murder. However, the police can only convict one or both of the players of murder if at least one of them confess. Although if one of the two people confess, the, complete, the police can convict both of them of murder. However, both of these players had an illegal weapon on them, and the police can use this illegal weapon to put each person in jail for a year if they wish. So the police do what you've seen on many detective dramas. They separate the two prisoners and they offer them a deal. They say, you better turn on your friend and because if you don't, he's going to turn on you. To, to, re to review the game, if neither prisoner confesses, the most the police can do is put each individual in jail for one year. However, if one person confesses, the police have the option of putting both people in jail for free, although if they wanted to, they could cut a deal and give someone a lesser sentence. So the prisoner's dilemma explains how the police can make it a dominant strategy for both people to confess. So the police offer the deal that's shown in these payoffs. The police will say, you know, let's say they, they take player one, um, she's in a separate room, and the police say, you know what, you understand this game. If you don't say anything and your co-conspirator doesn't say anything, you, you get to, you, we'll, we'll send you to jail for a year. That's all we can do. We know you've committed murder, but the best we can do is send you to jail for a year, so that's all we'll do. However, if you stay silent, but player two confesses, we're going to put you in jail for life because we only need one person to confess. And we bet player two is going to confess. So you're, you're in big trouble. If you stay silent and the other person confesses, you get life in prison. Now, if you choose to confess, we'll give you a great deal if player two is really stupid and stays silent. If you confess and player two stays silent, you get to go free. We won't even put you in jail for the weapons charge. Now, if you both confess, well, we'll both put you in jail for 20 years. Well, let's imagine you have a lawyer and your lawyer says, you know, yeah, the, the police are being completely honest about everything. They, they have to keep their word. So if, you know, you both confess, you really will get jail, put in jail for 20 years, not life. You know, if you confess and player two stays silent, you really will get to go free. The police are actually not allowed to lie about this. What should you do? And imagine that you're self-interested and, of course, your goal is to reduce the amount of, you know, minimize the amount of time you're in prison. Well, if you knew that player two would confess, if you stayed silent, you'd go to jail for life. That's really horrible. If you confessed, you'd go to jail for 20 years. Now, I know 20 years seems a lot, but when I explain this game to my students, I tell them, you know, most of you in 20 years from now will be younger than I am now. And I still think I have a lot of life ahead of me. So if you're convinced, you know, you are convinced that player two, your co-conspirator, confessed, you would want to confess too, because you'd rather go to jail for 20 years than for life. What if you were convinced your co-conspirator would remain silent? Well, if he's going to remain silent, if you remain silent, you go to jail for a year, which is bad. Not horrible, but it's pretty bad. Well, if you confess, you get to go free. Well, it's certainly better to be free, to go free, than spend a year in jail. So you, if you knew your co-conspirator would stay silent, you'd want to confess. That means you want to confess if the other person's going to remain silent, and you want to confess if they're going to confess. So you should confess no matter what. Now the game is symmetric. Player two faces the same situation. So player two will confess and you'll both end up here. Now this result is very counterintuitive. If you haven't had game theory before or much of it, you'll, you'll think this is wrong. I've, I've made a mistake. I'm some random guy on the internet. You know, what the, what the hell am I doing here? But it, it's not. Because your intuition screams, no, I want to be, I'd much rather be here than here, so why would I confess? The thing is, you never have the ability to move from here to here. You are in a separate room from your co-conspirator. 
you are going to confess or not confess independent of what the other person's going to do, right? The police are offering both of you these deals at the same time. You can't, so you can't move between here and here. What you can do is if your other player is going to be silent, you can move from here to here and you'd rather be here. They're going to confess. You can move between here and here and you would rather be here. So given where you can move, you're better off confessing and player two is better off confessing and you both end up in a really bad situation. This is what happens in game theory sometimes. Sometimes rational, self-interested people will do things that make them collectively worse off and they know they'll be collectively worse off. Let me tell you a story. It's, it's not related to this payoff, but this is how I sometimes talk about Prisoner's Dilemma. It's a weird story involving demons, but nevertheless. Let's imagine, you know, it's, it's a thousand, several thousand years ago, and your city is about to go to war with another city. And, you know, the, the winner of the city, it's going to be great for you. You'll, you'll get to take all their stuff and slave their population. The losers, man, they're going to lose everything. They'll be slaves. They'll be worse, they'll be killed. So really winning this battle is extraordinarily important for your city. And, you know, it looks like about an equal chance of winning or losing. Suddenly, demon appears. And the demon says, you know what? Right now, if you sacrifice 100 healthy, loved children from your city, I will give all of your warriors plus seven killing power. And I will subtract seven from the killing power of the warriors of the enemy. You know, plus seven killing power. Let's say that's that's pretty good. So you're thinking, well, you know, we got losing a hundred kids, we really that would be horrible and heartbreaking. But if it would significantly increase the chance of us winning, it, it, it's worth it. Because if we lose the battle, well, children will be slaves. Then the demon says, Oh, one more thing, because I'm totally honest. At this exact moment, I'm offering the same deal to your enemy. What do you do? Do you accept? Well, if you both accept the deal, right? Remember, the deal gives you plus seven killing power and takes away seven killing power from the enemy. You both accept it cancels out, and you all you've done is you've each sacrificed a hundred healthy loved children. But you kind of have to, don't you? Because the other side did make the deal and you didn't, you have a really good chance of losing. And of course, if they don't make the deal, they're stupid enough not to make the deal and you do, then it's probably worth, you know, making the child sacrifice to have a significantly less chance of everyone else in your city becoming slaves. So both sides probably accept the deal and that means 200 kids are killed for no net benefit. This is the logic of the prisoner's dilemma. You know, the demon can be completely honest about it. I should say for the record, since this is the internet, I'm of course completely opposed to child sacrifice and I don't believe in demons. So if never ever kill anyone because of a demon because they don't exist. And if you think they do, you have problems. But all right, let's go to another game. Now, this game, um, I've just put in numbers and I've done Prisoner's Dilemma with you can be either nice or being mean. Being nice is the equivalent of being silent. So let's look at this game. Being mean is a dominant strategy, right? I've made the game symmetric, so let's just go through for player one. If player two is nice, player one is better off being mean than nice. And if player two is mean, player one is better off mean than being nice. So mean is a dominant strategy for player one. It's also, you can verify it's a dominant strategy for player two. So both people have a dominant strategy of being mean. Well, they'll be mean and they'll each get a payoff of three. But boy, that's a bad result because if they were both nice, they could both get a payoff of seven. So do you think maybe could they come to some kind of deal where they both agree just to be nice? Well, yeah, if they trust each other, they can. And if they have some way of verifying their real force in their agreement, they can. But otherwise, no. The way these kind of games are played is, you know, I write down my choice at the exact same time you write down your choice. We do it in secret and we reveal. And I absolutely would like to come to, you know, like to talk to you and convince you to play nice. But if I've convinced you to play nice, I'm still going to want to be mean. You'll get the worst possible outcome. So um, to have a prisoner's dilemma, 
what you need is you need the mean outcome to be a dominant strategy. And it has to be for both players. I just wrote it for player one. You need the best payoff for a player to be when they're mean and the other person's nice. You take advantage of the other person. The worst outcome to be when you're nice and they're mean, you get take adva taken advantage of. And you need it, the everyone nice, you do better than if everyone's mean. But still, because of the dominance, everyone being mean, that's the that's where you'll end up. You'll be stuck in the prisoner's dilemma. At least if you can't change the game, right? When if I, you know, if I give you this game, you're stuck with it. In real life, you try to come up with some way of altering it. You know, hey, let's, you know, have a court. Let's, you know, we're relying on some, let's rely on some third party to enforce this. Let's, you know, develop a relationship so we know we can trust each other. But again, if you're just stuck with this game and you're both people that are rational and self-interested, they end up here, not a good outcome. They're stuck in the prisoner's dilemma. Okay, uh, the final game, I've made this um, even uh, even more, uh, even farther from the exact prisoner's dilemma. In, in this game, I mean, sorry, from the nice mean and silent talk. In, in this game, this is a prisoner's dilemma. First, we can see that B, which is the equivalent of mean, is dominant, right? Because if X is played, you'd rather be... Um, play B than A, and if Y is played, you'd rather play B than A. So B is a dominant strategy. Y is also a dominant strategy because if A is played, you'd rather be Y than X, and if B is played, you'd rather be Y than X. So B and Y, which are the equivalent of mean or the equivalent of confess, they're the dominant strategies. So the parties will end up here, which of course is worse for both of them than if they both did their nice AX thing. Um, also, the best outcome for each player is if he or she is um, is mean, does the mean equivalent, and the other person does the nice equivalent. And the worst outcome for each player is if they do the nice thing and the other person does the mean thing. So this is a, another example of um, the Prisoner's Dilemma game. Uh, so uh, thank you for listening. Goodbye.